Last time, we saw how archaeologists and historians use digital technology to explore the world's past with 3D scanners, virtual reality simulations, and complex computer databases. Today, we look at how 3D technology helps us understand our complex behavior and how we use it to record and analyze the way we move. UC Merced cognitive scientists and computer engineers are collaborating to understand the nuanced way people interact with their environment and to build a digital library of human motion that could be used to build lifelike human avatars for use in telemedicine, education, or ways not yet imagined. Computer engineering professor Marcelo Kalman and his research team at UC Merced can track and record people's movements with the same technology used in Hollywood. But instead of capturing the data and applying it during post-production to an avatar in the virtual environment, Kalman's team does it in real time, giving subjects full virtual immersion. This room uh, brings together several different technologies. We have a motion capture setup that can track full body motions in real time, and we have a virtual reality screen that allows people to immersively interact with virtual environments uh, uh, in real time. And in full scale. While having your avatar interact with fixed environments is pretty straightforward, the goal of this research is to let a user demonstrate how to perform the interactions within an intuitive virtual reality interface. We want to learn how people interact with, uh, with each other and simulate that when in applications that would need people interacting with virtual characters. So the main ap application that we're looking at is how people would uh, teach virtual characters how to do things so that these virtual characters could then teach others how to perform uh, tasks and, and, and actions. Before the motion capture technology became popular, you would be modeling by hand the motion of each articulation of the body using 3D uh, commercial applications. Some studios have done this where they would uh, use motion capture and treat the motion capture data, clean it up, and usually some animators, human intervention on top to beautify the motion or make it more uh, compliant with a certain direction from the, di the director. In the film and game industry, motion capture is becoming commonplace. But for many potential applications, it has not been adopted yet. Motion capture uses and needs related to science are now just becoming understood. The research that has to be done, that is still being done on these areas, exactly on how to adapt these motions, so that you can uh, reuse them in different uh, situations, you can apply them to characters of different sizes, you can uh, go to precise locations, so that is, uh, these are problems that we still have to solve. Otherwise, we just have a few discrete number of motions that you can just uh, choose which one to play, you don't have a good range of controlling them. So not capturing is just one part of the problem, but parametrization, reuse, adaptation, that is also another problem, important problem to be solved. The problem is more complex than one might think. It's not just a matter of dramatizing a person's limb motions. Human movement and interactions are filled with subtleties, like pointing and gesturing. Kalman's progression of this technology has led to more human-like articulation, and also to collaborative research with cognitive scientists Teeny Matlock and Justin Matthews. They're making discoveries in the way people point in reference to themselves, others, and other objects. Some of the problems that emerge in the space of engineering are problems that emerge in actual pointing among humans and so on. So how do we blend one gesture movement to another and this kind of thing? Blending is something that computer scientists who are interested in graphics work a lot on and have a lot of questions about. We're basically trying to understand how human movement is important um, when designing virtual humans. Uh, in virtual reality. And so this, this research specifically um, tackles the question of what do people do when they're pointing at objects um, and they're trying to maybe teach someone about a specific object? How do they reference that object not only with their hands while pointing but also with their head or eyes while speaking about the object? I originally got interested in pointing because I was interested in spatial language. How is it that people identify things in space or um, what's the real estate of that space and how do we describe it verbally and then of course an interesting part of that is how we use pointing to disambiguate what we're saying when it comes to spatial language. Pointing is a behavior that you see in all languages, all cultures across the world 
Um, in Western cultures, we generally do it with the hand. So we might do this if we're pointing at an object. We might do this if we're pointing at multiple objects. In non-Western cultures or languages, you'll see some other kinds of pointing gestures. So in one culture in Africa, they point with the lips. And so individuals pointing at something across the room may do something like this, right? And this sort of thing. And then there are other cultures that may use the head more in pointing, kind of like this and so on. So it's not always the hand that's used in pointing. It's one thing to program the subtle movements for a video game, but if you want to create an avatar whose actions and movements or gestures are designed for, let's say, a safety simulation, even cultural factors must be observed, recorded, and programmed for an accurate human interaction. Tini and I were brought in on the project to kind of bring the human element into this, this research. So our part was to, to bring in actual humans, have them do these movements so then we can take that data that we collect and incorporate it into the computer models that will then drive these, these virtual humans. The first question there is, what is the best way of doing this database? What are the limitations? What is the coverage space? How many variations we need? And for that, we need also to work on the user interface. What is the best way of capturing, modeling, and adapting and testing these databases, right? Once these databases are modeled, then uh, we need to go beyond that and see how we can reuse the database to animate autonomous virtual characters that could then be teaching the information to uh, other users or just for training them. What this technology allows us to do is capture that data in, in much more fine-grained detail so that we can actually capture the movement of the hand as it's pointing toward the object. We can capture that in real time and we can capture it down to a few millimeters of accuracy. Whereas with video reconstruction or video recording, you can't really get that level of detail. You can just talk about the movement that a person participated in, but here you actually capture all the data and it's time locked to when they're doing it and how they're doing it. In our work, we are focused more on modeling the motions. And modeling means how we can capture motions from real people, but not only capture and play them, but how you can capture the meaningful part of it. So when you demonstrate how to make a surgery procedure, you later on would need to readapt that same procedure to a different patient. While each team is focused on its own research goals, the relationship between computer science and cognitive science has been mutually beneficial and created new knowledge. One really interesting discovery for me was the head movement that goes along with pointing. So we're looking at how does the head move when people are pointing at, at, at objects. We are starting looking into simple gestures, how we can learn them, replicate them, coordinate them with full body motions. Applications for these technologies are far-reaching and limited only by our imaginations and may impact the world on a large scale in diverse areas. One of the directions we are going next is applying this research for assistance with physical therapy, for example. You can have a virtual character precisely telling you which motions you, you are doing. We can have the motion capture system tracking you and, and, and logging your prog progress and so on. So some of the applications would be in, in learning um, or teaching, maybe something like telemedicine where you're teaching an individual to do a certain task, um, but you're not physically present in their environment. So you might be controlling uh, an avatar that's in a remote location and you can actively control this avatar um, either live through your own movements or having a computer model those movements for you. Um, and so it's important to make those avatars look uh, as human as possible because you don't want that to be distracting from the task of actually learning the content that you set out to teach. This research, pulling in experts from engineering and cognitive science, is an example of how some complex questions require an interdisciplinary approach. Engineering here brings all of their knowledge about both human motion capture and also the technology that's used in this power wall setup. Tini and I have a lot of experience in um, collecting data from human subjects, but in terms of implementing that technology um, into like a large-scale device like this, um, it takes a lot more people um, to control these systems and to write the computer code and to decode the information once you collect it. Um, and so I think, I think engineering and cognitive science together, it's a really good marriage um, in terms of what each like, constituent brings to the table. One of the missions of UC Merced is to um, engage in interdisciplinary research and do uh, innovative work at the intersection of multiple disciplines. So that's been really interesting, the interdisciplinary part of it.